Hello and welcome to The Bard's Truth with your host, The Green Bard. Thanks for joining us for The Dire Wolves of Winterfell, Episode 4.3, A Clash of Kings, Summer, and The Winged Wolf, Chained. In this volume, while we continue our themes, we see how close Summer and Bran truly are through the introduction of wolf dreams. Later, Bran gets his first mentor in Jojen, and we even get more information about how Bran's power fits into this bond. Finally, Bran is isolated in the crypts, and we see a step change in Bran's ability to truly warg into Summer. By the end of the book, we'll see how the magic is indeed stronger in Bran, which makes their bond develop stronger and faster. Maester Lewin's anti-magic bias is continued rather heavy-handedly in this volume as well. Coupled with the effect of Old Nan's stories, Bran fears the obvious magical implications of his dreams. The effect is to limit his receptivity to the message of the Three-Eyed Crow, Jojen, and the Tree Dreams. Jojen calls Bran the Winged Wolf, but he is chained to Winterfell by this fear and reticence. Our dire wolf themes continue to develop in this volume as Bran's powers develop. Protection and savagery, as well as pack behavior, are exhibited by the two remaining wolves for sure, though first directed at the reeds. Mirroring is especially heightened in this incident, too. Unfortunately, the theme of the dire wolves not being able to protect the boys when separated from them continues as well, partially resulting in all that is wrought by Theon and Ramsay. A Clash of Kings, Bran 1. The first Bran chapter in A Clash of Kings is the first mention of a wolf dream in the story. Although Old Nan tells Bran that he is not the first Stark to experience one. She also echoes the SSM from our introduction. All the Starks are wargs to some degree. This chapter is almost non stop dire wolf interaction and wolf dream hints. Bran is stuck in his room a lot and finds interest in the behavior of the wolves, especially in howling. This is an example of the call of the pack. He tries to get in the wolves' heads, especially about why they are howling at the comet and he gets a lot of conflicting feedback from people around Winterfell. One ironic comment is from Roderick Cassell, who asks, Who can know the mind of a wolf? Oh, Sir Roderick, the answer is staring you in the face. It's Bran. He could not walk, nor climb, nor hunt, nor fight with a wooden sword as once he had, but he could still look. He liked to watch the windows begin to glow all over Winterfell as candles and hearth fires were lit behind the diamond-shaped panes of tower and hall and he loved to listen to the dire wolves sing to the stars. Of late he often dreamed of wolves. They are talking to me, brother to brother, he told himself, when the dire wolves howled. He could almost understand them, not quite, not truly, but almost, as if they were singing in a language he had once known and somehow had forgotten. The Walders might be scared of them, but the Starks had wolf blood. Old Nan told him so, though it is stronger in some than in others, she warned. Summer's howls were long and sad, full of grief and longing. Shaggy dogs were more savage. Their voices echoed through the yards and halls until the castle rang and it seemed as though some great pack of dire wolves haunted Winterfell, instead of only two. Two were the ones that had been six. Do they miss their brothers and sisters too? Bran wondered. Are they calling to Grey Wind and Ghost? To Nymeria and Lady Shade? Do they want them to come home and be a pack together? It's interesting how each person gives a little hint about the nature of the wolf bond. Roderick, the mind mingling, Farlin, their independence, Gage, the hunt, and Lewin, pack behavior. Osha speaks to their sense of danger. Who can know the mind of a wolf, Sir Roderick Cassell said when Bran asked him why they howled. Bran's lady mother had named him Castellan of Winterfell in her absence, and his duties left him little time for idle questions. It's freedom they're calling for, declared Farlin, who was kennelmaster and had no more love for the dire wolves than his hounds did. They don't like being walled up, and who's to blame them? Wild things belong in the wild, not in a castle. They want to hunt, agreed Gage the cook, as he tossed cubes of suet in a great kettle of stew. A wolf smells better than any man. Like as not, they've caught the scent of prey. Maester Lewin did not think so. Wolves often howl at the moon. These are howling at the comet. See how bright it is, Bran? Perchance they think it is the moon. When Bran repeated that to Asha, she laughed aloud. Your wolves have more wit than your maester, the wildling woman said. They know truths the gray man has forgotten. The way she said it made him shiver, and when he asked her what the comment meant, she answered, Blood and fire, boy, and nothing sweet. While that makes for an interesting set of interpretations, my interpretation is that the wolves are howling in mirroring of Bran and Rickon. Bran is sad at the separation. 
longing for summer. We'll talk about Rickon and Shaggy Dog later. The howling continues, making us all wonder what it's like to be in the mind of a wolf. Bran, remembering his wolf dream, is determined to find out. He starts howling himself. It's a bit of humor at the beginning of this part of the saga, although it's clear that this pack behavior is recognized by the wolves and represents a deepening of the bond. Ominously, though, this is the first time that both wolves have been confined away from the boys since Bran awoke. Did nobody tell Sir Roderick of the protection that Summer has provided their lord? Is his memory so short? And still the dire wolves howled. The guards on the walls muttered curses. Hounds in the kennels barked furiously. Horses kicked at their stalls. The walders shivered by their fire, and even Maester Lewin complained of sleepless nights. Only Bran did not mind. Sir Roderick had confined the wolves to the godswood after Shaggy Dog bit Little Walder, but the stones of Winterfell played queer tricks with sound, and sometimes it sounded as if they were in the yard right below Bran's window. Other times he would have sworn they were up on the curtain walls, loping round like sentries. He wished that he could see them. Later. Summer had howled the day Bran had fallen, and for long after as he lay broken in his bed. Rob had told him so before he went away to war. Summer had mourned for him, and Shaggy Dog and Grey Wind had joined in his grief. And the night the Bloody Raven had brought word of their father's death, the wolves had known that too. Bran had been in the Maester's turret with Rickon, talking of the children of the forest when Summer and Shaggy Dog had drowned out Lewin with their howls. Who are they mourning now? Had some enemy slain the king in the north, who used to be his brother Rob? Had his bastard brother John Snow fallen from the wall? Had his mother died, or one of his sisters? Or was this something else, as Maester and Septon and Old Nan seemed to think? If I were truly a dire wolf, I would understand the song he thought wistfully. In his wolf dreams he could race up the sides of mountains, jagged icy mountains taller than any tower, and stand at the summit beneath the full moon with all the world below him, the way it used to be. Oh! Bran cried tentatively. He cupped his hands around his mouth and lifted his head to the comet. Oh! Oh! he howled. It sounded stupid, high and howl and quavering, a little boy's howl, not a wolf's. Yet Summer gave answer, his deep voice drowning out Bran's thin one, and Shaggy Dog made it a chorus. Bran howled again. They howled together, last of their pack. The noise brought a guard to his door, Hayhead with the wind on his nose. He peered in, saw Bran howling out the window, and said, What's this, my prince? It made Bran feel queer when they called him prince though he was Rob's heir, and Rob was king in the north now. He turned his head to howl at the guard. Ooh! Oh, oh, oh! Hey had screwed up his face. Now you stop that there. Oh, oh, oh! Oh, oh, oh! Hey had summons the maester. Certainly Maester Lewin knows better than to confine the wolves away from the boys, but he can't admit it to himself due to his learned prejudices against magic. That skepticism is in full force as we move forward here. Bran is dropping hints left and right about wolf dreams and tree dreams. It's clear that he's being bombarded with information in these dreams and is trying to make sense of it. He doesn't even seem to realize that he's dreaming inside Summer's mind. He desperately misses the wolf, given the forced separation. I wonder if this separation fostered a quicker development of the wolf dreams than might have otherwise happened. Thinking back to part three, the same didn't happen immediately with Arya and Nymeria, although their connections seemed to be reignited when in closer proximity while still being separated in the Riverlands. All men must sleep, Bran, even princes. When I sleep, I turn into a wolf. Bran turned his face away and looked back out into the night. Do wolves dream? All creatures dream, I think, yet not as men do. Do dead men dream? Bran asked, thinking of his father. In the dark crypts below Winterfell, a stone mason was chiseling out his father's likeness in granite. Some say yes, some no, the maester answered. The dead themselves are silent on the matter. Do trees dream? Trees? No. They do, Rand said with sudden certainty. They dream tree dreams. I dream of a tree sometimes. A weirwood, like the one in the godswood. It calls to me. The wolf dreams are better. I smell things, and sometimes I can taste the blood. Notice that last line, he can taste the blood. Though Lewin chooses to deny its import, that is probably the first direct hint at sharing senses through the bond in this story, even if my analysis suggests earlier hidden references. 
Bran goes on to protest the separation from Summer. He knows the wolf's worth as a protector, and he also needs the affection, one theme that is lacking here and so often in this volume due to the separations. Home, it's their fault you won't let me have Summer. The Frey boy did not ask to be attacked, the maester said, no more than I did. That was Shaggy Dog. Rickon's big black wolf was so wild he even frightened Bran at times. Summer never bit anyone. Summer ripped out a man's throat in this very chamber, or have you forgotten? The truth is, those sweet pups you and your brothers found in the snow have grown into dangerous beasts. The Frey boys are wise to be wary of them. Lewin, it seems that you have forgotten that when Summer tore that man's throat out, it was saving Bran and Catelyn's life. Bran even argues that Summer would protect him. But Lewin is so sure that everyone else needs protection from the wolves that he is unable to remember that truth. Bran goes on. Summer would save me, Bran insisted stubbornly. Princess should be allowed to sail the sea and hunt boar in the wolf's wood and joust with lances. Bran, child, why do you torment yourself so? One day you may be able to do some of these things, but now you are only a boy of eight. I'd sooner be a wolf, then I could live in the wood and sleep when I wanted, and I could find Arya and Sansa. I'd smell where they were and go and save them. And when Rob went to battle, I'd fight beside him like Grey Wind. I'd tear out the Kingslayer's throat with my teeth. Rip! And then the war would be over, and everyone would come back to Winterfell. If I was a wolf, he howled. Ow! 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 Lewin raised his voice. A true prince would welcome. Ow! Bran howled louder. Ow! 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 The key takeaway here is that spending nights as a dire wolf is definitely rubbing off on Bran sort of a reverse mirroring. It's cute, but it bears remembering that Bran is impressionable to Summer's wolfishness. As an aside, all the howling in that chapter reminds me of the Ozzy Osbourne song, Bark at the Moon. I've made a recording of the song, and will be reposting it soon on this channel as a dire wolf cover. A Clash of Kings, Bran 2 The theme of the wolves being protectors is at the forefront in the following chapter, coupled with further discussion of wolf dreams. We also see affection, as the boys do get a chance to play with the dire wolves in the godswood, though they remain confined at night. Chekhov's confinement. We are also reminded of the wolves' savagery, their sense of threats, and pack behavior. So basically all our themes are in evidence in the short passages that follow. Let him. I always wanted a wolf-skinned cloak. Summer would tear your fat head off, Bran said. Little Walder banged a mailed fist against his breastplate. Does your wolf have steel teeth to bite through plate and mail? Later. As you will, my prince, said Sir Roderick. You did well. Bran flushed with pleasure. Being a lord was not so tedious as he had feared. And since Lady Hornwood had been so much briefer than Lord Manderley, he even had a few hours of daylight left to visit Summer. He liked to spend time with his wolf every day, when Sir Roderick and the maester allowed it. No sooner had Hodor entered the godswood than Summer emerged from under an oak almost as if he had known they were coming. Bran glimpsed a lean black shape watching from under the undergrowth as well. Shaggy, he called. Here, Shaggy, to me. But Rickon's wolf vanished as swiftly as he appeared. Note how Summer knew Bran was coming. Did he know through the bond, through mirroring? That may be more likely than the mundane explanation, that he smelled or heard them coming. Next, Summer evaluates Asha to not be a threat. And then Asha exploded up out of the pool with a great splash. So sudden that even Summer leapt back, snarling. Hodor jumped away, wailing, Hodor! Hodor! in dismay until Bran patted his shoulder to soothe his fears. How can you swim in there? he asked Asha. Isn't it cold? As a babe I suckled on icicles, boy. I like the cold. Asha swam to the rocks and rose dripping. She was naked, her skin bumpy with goose prickles. Summer crept close and sniffed at her. Later. He'd never dare hurt me. He's scared of Summer, no matter what he says. Then might be he's not so stupid as he seems. Asha was always wary around the dire wolves. The day she was taken, Summer and Grey Wind between them had torn three wildlings to bloody pieces. Or might be he is in that taste of trouble too. She tied up her hair. You have more of them wolf dreams? No. He did not like to talk about the wolf dreams. A prince should lie better than that, Asha laughed. Well, your dreams are your business. Mine's in the kitchens and I'd best be getting back before Gage starts to shouting and waving that big spoon of his. By your leave, my prince. She should never have talked about the wolf dreams, Bran thought, as Hodor carried him up the steps to his bedchamber. He fought against sleep as long as he could, 
but in the end it took him as it always did. On this night he dreamed of the weirwood. It was looking at him with its deep red eyes, calling to him with its twisted wooden mouth, and from its pale branches the three-eyed crow came flapping, pecking at his face, and crying his name in a voice as sharp as swords. Notice at the end of the passage how Bran is now not happy about having the dreams. Could it be that he still likes the wolf dreams and it's only the other dreams he's not happy about? Could it be that he's realizing they are real and he is going into Summer? Could Summer's mood about being confined be affecting Bran's mood? Could he be worried about being a warg? I think the answer to all these questions is yes. That last idea may worry him most, though, save for the Lannister slash falling dreams because wargs don't have a good reputation in many of the stories Old Nan has told him, especially the scary ones that Bran likes. Perhaps he feels he won't become a warg if he resists the crow opening his third eye. That's it for this episode. The next episode covers the introduction of the reeds prior to Theon's attack. We'll see you then. Thanks to all the terrific artists who let me use their work on this YouTube video. Thanks as always to my family, in this case for the art. If you enjoy this content, you can also consider supporting us on Patreon.